session we're going to have this afternoon is really much in tune with what we had this morning, so uh, you should like uh, uh, the rhythm of it. So I don't know if any of you picked up The Economist today, or yesterday actually, when the new issue came out. And the cover story is about world's economy's strange new rules. And strange indeed they have become. The disruption of geopolitics that have, have created on the economy are patent. And for those who were last year, and Thierry mentioned it this morning in his, in his speech, uh, Olivier Blanchard, the former chief economist of the IMF, stressed last year how the fundamentals remained good. Record low unemployment in the States, moderate inflation, and nothing, nothing should have triggered in the old world a new range of quantitative easing. And yet, <laughs> we're there. So today, we can say at least if it's a slowdown, we know that we're in the midst of an industrial recession. Uh, PMIs are going under or reaching the 50 threshold. And the lack of certainty created by the trade war launched by Donald Trump has had its toll, as have the uncertainties uh, linked to Brexit. Last week, the new head of the IMF, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, issued a stern warning for her first public speech. Worldwide growth is slowing because of commercial tensions. The world economy is experiencing a synchronized slowdown, she insisted, with trade growth almost null. And global GDP will be amputated of $700 billion of dollars this year alone, which is the size of the Swiss economy. And this is occurring while the WTO is at a standstill and is in need for urgent reform. And while the United States are pursuing bilateral agreements in the hope of diminishing their own trade imbalances. Yesterday, President Trump said America had reached a partial trade deal with China that would forestall the, the tariff increase schedule for October 15th. So we're gonna discuss this with our panelists, um, this current climate of mistrust and its consequences on trade investment and the global economy. And we're going to also try to envision possible remedies. So for that, we have for this, uh, with us this afternoon, Mr. Bark, who is uh, the former uh, Minister of Trade of Korea, and that you know him well because he's been on, on many panels at the WPC uh, already. Uh, the actual Deputy Director of the WTO, and that's a hard job, we commend you for it, Carl Browner. Uh, and a great scholar who uh, has a lot of expertise on global economic governance, our Austrian friend, Gabriel uh, Feldmermeer. And finally, uh, the executive vice president of one of the most important, the, the most important economic think tank in DC, but probably in the world too, because there are not that many of them. It's the P Peterson, Industry for Inter uh, Peterson Institute for International Economics, and that's Marcus Noland. And unfortunately, Mr. Guaranavi is not with us uh, this afternoon. So to start, uh, my first question was about last night when uh, President Trump announced that they had a partial deal with, with China. And uh, what was your reaction to it? Did you think it means anything? Is it good to have a little push on the brakes? Well, uh, I think it means something, but uh, not much. Because uh, we had this kind of uh, example already two or three times, uh, right after the G20 meeting in Argentina, we have a truce uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. And then they met again in uh, early March and uh, they talk about some, something and then uh, they go into the, another truce. And in May, same thing. Right. So this time they're just delaying the extra uh, imposition of tariff uh, uh, after Christmas, whatever. Yeah. So it means something, but uh, we don't have any visible agreement yet. Right. That's my observation. It's a lot of stop and go, as you said. Well, what was your reaction to it, Carl? Yeah, I, I like the fact that um, <clears throat> the parties are talking and uh, that there seems to be uh, some convergence, but I share the view of my neighbor. Um, it, um, it is a little bit of a relief for a very short time, mm -hmm. but if the big goal of the US, of the president, is to um, shrink the deficit that they have with China, a lot more is necessary. Nice and I think a lot more inside the US is necessary. Gabriel? Yeah, uh, so I think economically this is uh, pretty much insignificant uh, because the, the uh, tariffs that have already been put in place don't go away. It's just that a further escalation uh, mm -hmm. is avoided. 
uh, and, and some of the things that are promised now happen anyway. So uh, imports of uh, pork meat, for example, into China are going up very strongly already, also mm -hmm. from the United States, because they had to slaughter uh, large uh, shares of the, the pig population because of, uh, because of an epidemic. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, uh, the US president is not uh, very eager to uh, to to have tariffs uh, on, on Christmas presents. Uh, so <laughs> I think you know, the pork story and the Christmas <laughs> story, uh, and, and then we yeah. have this sort of small yeah. deal, but uh, it, yeah. it does nothing. Also uncertainty, the big yeah. issue we discussed this morning is, is not going away. One could even say that this type of negotiation actually exacerbates uncertainty because it shows the back and forth and how transactional this, this all is mm -hmm. and how much showbiz is, is yeah. there out. So, it's um, very much like Trump, you know, transaction, showbiz. I mean, we're yeah, very much yeah, uh, yeah. into it. Yeah. What about you, Marcus? Transactions and showbiz. Yeah, I, I think these will be uh, um, uh, running themes for the next hour. Um, one hopes that this is a first step towards something greater, mm -hmm. uh, but I am skeptical. Donald Trump is an avowed protectionist. He makes no bones about it. And the people who surround him uh, do not suppose, support a liberal, rules-based international order. They are not friends of the WTO. They want to see trade organized through bilateral managed trade deals. If they resemble anything, it's the European governments of the 1930s. <laughs> and uh, Donald Trump, as you mentioned, launched a series of trade wars. Um, it is important to understand how big this is in the US context. If you simply calculate the, the implied, uh, implied applied tariff rates on either imports from China or imports from the world as a whole, Donald Trump has basically moved the United States from the neighborhood of, of uh, the EU or Japan with applied rates of less than 2% to the neighborhood of Brazil and India. We're gonna be another you know, big emerging market with populist political leadership. Mm. Um, the uh, implied applied rates on China would be more than 25%. I mean, These huge numbers. So if you look at the specific deal last night, first of all, there's no deal. Yeah. There's not even, a, there's no text. There's not even a joint statement. The, the Trump, the <laughs> Trump uh, administration made assertions that have not been repeated in China, uh -huh. so we don't know what that's about. There is a postponement of tariffs. The tariffs were supposed to go from 25 to 30%. That's been postponed, but it's not been taken off the table. And the core issues that supposedly were the justification for the trade war in the first place, uh, intellectual property rights, forced technology transfer, and so on, are not talked about. Yeah. So um, one hopes this is the seed of something that becomes much greater. Um, but uh, it, it doesn't look like much. One last thing about showbiz. Um, this also has to be understood in the context of the uh, impeachment effort underway in the United States right now. Trump's support among the farmers is eroding. Uh, he has been hurt badly by the Chinese retaliation on soybeans, as well as uh, not only on pork from China, but the fact that he pulled the United States out of TPP. So the United States producers faced big trade diversion problems in the Japanese market on pork. Mm -hmm. So one, you know, a, an audience like this needs to expect over the next year or so, not just in the trade area, but foreign policy area, that as the impeachment process ramps up, President Trump is going to be increasingly desperate to change the conversation in the United States and have some sort of positive or some sort of victory he can point to. And so he's going to take something like this, which appears to be nothing, and turn it into, you know, we're, we're making progress with China, and the rest of the countries here as well. Expect comments on trade and other foreign policy issues that may bear no resemblance to reality that are dri being driven by domestic political messaging. Okay, so I guess we all agree that last night we have a French expression for that. It's called la poudre aux yeux. I don't know how you say it in English, but it's very, uh, it sounds well in French. It's just uh, for the show. Uh, so let's start uh, with the assessment of damages because this trade war has been going on for some time now and uh, it has caused a lot of difficulties. Uh, the, the head of the IMF was saying that growth is going to, GDP growth is slowing down, but commercial growth is slowing down. So, uh, Mr. Mark, what, what, are, what do you see as the first damages of this trade war already? And we'll go back to the reasons afterwards. Yes, uh, the damages are, uh, at the beginning, it looks like very insignificant. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, as time goes by, especially by the uh, view of economists, uh, this negative uh, effect of cross uh, tariff retaliations uh, is spreading uh, rapidly into the whole you know, of the US economy, of, of course, with China also. So more direct uh, damages between US and, and, and China. I think in the case of uh, uh, China, of course, the uh, exporters, producers of export items which are heading to the United States are hurt, most hurt. Uh, according to my uh, simple calculation, uh, out of total China's uh, export, 19% are going to the United States. It's not a small number. Mm -hmm. So uh, the exporters are hurt very much. These exporters include not only Chinese, but also other foreign companies too. In the case of the uh, United States, as Marcus uh, uh, pointed out, uh, of course, the uh, consumers and the users of uh, goods imported from China, mm -hmm. and also uh, US farmers who are exporting agricultural mm -hmm. products to, uh, to, uh, in, uh, to China. Story, yeah. So in terms of some small numbers, uh, out of total US imports, 22%, almost 22% are coming from China. It's, it's a big number. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm saying consumers and producers are hurting. And also uh, the farmers, uh, I think I heard also 17% of uh, total agricultural export of US is going to China. So overall, these two countries are, uh, we know that clearly uh, they, are, they are hurting. And these days, many researchers are analyzing uh, more specific uh, uh, re results. And the Korea, you know, like, uh, for example, Korea, uh, Dr. Sagong mentioned that this morning, but uh, China and United States is Korea's number one and number two trading partner. So Korea is caught uh, by these yeah, two uh, yeah. big uh, giants. And uh, according to the WTO report, uh, for uh, first seven months from January to July this year, Korea's export reduced by almost 9%, 8.6%, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, worst uh, record Good. among top 10 world exporting mm -hmm. countries. So we are really hurt. Yes. And what about uh, our export to China? Similar period, we lost uh, almost 17% uh, uh, reduction compared to the uh, same period of uh, mm. uh, previous year. So Korea is really hurt. And also, if you look at the details, uh, mostly uh, the parts and components and equipment producers who are exporting to China, they are, they are really hurt because our exports, out of our export, almost 79% are those kind of items. So I can give you some, some example of damages. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty impressive figures. This morning, around the round table, you were moderating, uh, Gabriel. Uh, one of the um, consequences was also uh, on FDI, direct investments. Uh, can you tell us, or whoever wants to, uh, about the effect that trade war has on that because of the uncertainty it creates? Exactly. So I mean, if you look at the, the big macroeconomic aggregates, uh, investment is by far the most volatile and it reacts most uh, to news or to you know, changed information and also to uncertainty. Mm -hmm. You can postpone investment, but you can't postpone consumption so much when people need to eat and so on. And so this procrastination uh, is what, uh, what, what matters so much now, as uh, uh, Olivier Blanchard explained this mm -hmm. morning. Um, uh, that you know, if you look at uh, Korea, another uh, you know, striking feature of the Korean economy right now is how much investment is suffering. So it's been negative for the last quarters, I think three, four quarters already. Uh, and, and that re simply reflects the fact that if you don't know what the markets are in the future, whether there are tariffs or no tariffs, uh, w what can you do as an as a entrepreneur? You can only wait. Mm -hmm. What you can also do, and th that's the counter argument, is, and that is valid, for example, for the United States, they say if there is a large net importing market like the United States, and you face as an exporter from Europe, you face uncertainty about the market access conditions, about the tariffs, mm -hmm. then the only hands you have is actually to produce more in the United States. And if you talk to the, the German car manufacturers, what do they, they do? What do they do is that, well, we need to restructure our operations in the United so States. So it's relocation of factories? Yes, but mm -hmm. they don't invest more because uh, you know, they, they traditionally also produce their SUVs uh, in, in Spartanburg, let's say, uh, in, in for the Chinese market. And that market is going down, so mm -hmm. it, it's going closed up. So, so there, is, there is two things. So there's procrastination, and then there is investment redirection uh, into large markets 
where you can hedge, where you can use investment as a hedge. And so in, this, in some, theoretically, you know, the effect on investment is ambiguous, yeah, you, but, but if you look, if you, you know, go through, go through uh, simple models, uh, the, the direct effect, so the effect on pro the progressionation effect is much larger, so it's not good for investment. Yeah. Marcus, want to add something? Sure. Um, so we know that since the United States initiated these tariff wars, the Treasury has collected about 35 or 36 billion dollars in tariff revenue from the special protection. So that's, that's a fact. Um, we have uh, economic models that are now coming out where people are trying to model the effects of this. And the results are coming up with, while negative, are not particularly large. And there's reasons to believe that those models are underestimating the effects for two reasons. The first one is the one Olivier spoke about this morning, which is we just have, we have a really hard time capturing in our model fundamental policy uncertainty and hence the impact on investment. So that we know. The second thing, which Olivier didn't mention, is supply chains. Mm -hmm. When Donald uh, Trump was running for president in the summer of 2016, my institution did a project where we tried to model the trade policy proposals of the two major candidates. Um, and in the case of Trump, we took his statements at face value and we were trying to figure out how to model them. We ended up talking to some of our corporate supporters and had some really interesting conversations with them. And, and I'm not gonna name the firm, but we had a conversation with one that went something like this. Okay, if Donald Trump puts a 30% tariff on Mexico, which is what he was threatening to do, and we estimate or we assess that it's not gonna last more than six months, we'll just wait it out, and we'll lose X billion dollars a month. If it's going to last more than six months, then we have to, we have to get out of Mexico. Now, if we're gonna shut down activities in Mexico, where are we gonna start them again? And uh, the, the, the corporate leadership found out they did not understand their own supply chains. To actually make their contingency plans, they had to drill down to the level of individual product line managers. And in the case of this firm, they decided, well, a lot of that production in Mexico would be moved to Singapore. Well, to make room in Singapore, we're gonna have to move things out of Singapore. And some of that's going to go to China. Some of it was gonna go to Central Europe, I think the Czech Republic. So you had a situation in which a threat, uh, threatened action against Mexico could end up with increased production in Czech Republic. There is no way any economist using a model and publicly available data is gonna come up with that result. And so just, just we know this stuff is bad, we, but our models are not good at capturing some of the f basic channels through which these types of policies operate. Mm. Okay, both uh, Gabriel and then Carl. Just, yeah. You're totally right, Marcus, uh, but what this does is it uh, gives huge incentives to us economists and, and you know, there's a lot of uh, research now on how to you know, incorporate supply chains into models and, uh, and uh, that's the good thing uh, about Donald Trump. It creates a lot of variance in the data and it creates a lot of things that we thought are not worthwhile investigating and now we think we need really to understand those old fashioned uh, items like <laughs> tariffs, no? So that, that's, the, that's the only positive that I have. Uh, we should give Donald Trump and Boris Johnson the Nobel Prize in Economics for the stimulation of new research. <laughs> They're actually doing good for your profession. Yeah, I, I only wanted to point out the 37 billion that the Treasury collected, they collected from the American consumer. They did not collect it from the Chinese or from anybody. They collect, I, I see your uh, hand movement. I, I know your studies on it. You, you say that there is a benefit because the Chinese uh, lower their prices. And, um, but the fact remains that 37 billion were collected from the um, American consumers. Can I add one, one more thing about investment, international investment? It's not my uh, research area, but uh, as a journalistic kind of uh, uh, opinions from other people, uh, because of the... Uh, Obama's uh, period, mm -hmm. uh, U.S. emphasized so-called remaking America. And also Trump uh, says uh, America first kind mm -hmm. of policies, mm -hmm. providing a lot of incentives to the U.S. companies who are operating abroad, please come back to the U.S. And has I, that happened? Uh, that, that's what I'm saying. You know, I don't have any statistics uh, about recent years, but mm -hmm. uh, from 2010 to 2016, A.T. Coney actually mm -hmm. uh, calculate the cumulative uh, numbers. Uh, by that uh, you know, six years period, 
more than 800 firms return to the, back to U.S. They are talking about this issue as a so-called reshoring right. rather than foreign investment. Mm -hmm. That could happen. And uh, I visited uh, uh, Taipei before I come here. Mm -hmm. And Taiwan is also doing the same thing. And um, lots of companies who are operating in, in China, they return to Taiwan. But of course, government is providing a lot of incentive. Mm -hmm. So in other words, uh, under this kind of uncertain uh, kind of uh, world trade environment, and also government is really pursuing so-called inward-looking you know, trade uh, kind of uh, policies, mm -hmm. then maybe uh, investment will be reduced, uh, which could have gone to other, other, other parts of the world. Just I want to add one thing. Yeah. It's interesting what you were saying about the dismantling of the value chain, because uh, there was a report from the World Bank about last week, actually, asking for more globalization, saying that globalization had been the way to, to take countries out of poverty. And uh, if you start uh, breaking uh, the value chains, uh, you're going to you know, put them back where they were, or you're not going to help everybody rising. Do you agree with that uh, opinion? So I, I think the, uh, the multilateral order that we have, let's say, until 2010 or so, mm -hmm. uh, uh, produced convergence. You know? And the period of hyperglobalization, as some say, led to the great convergence. And uh, um, in, a, in a world where power dominates and uh, where international rules are, are no longer taken for granted, can be changed all the time, all the uncertainty, this uh, hurts small countries most and the largest countries that have big, uniform, single markets least. Uh, so it's maybe not a surprise that the country with the largest single market, the United States, is doing this, uh, but uh, we should expect that it, uh, you know, this breakdown of the multilateral order hurts the poor, smallest countries most, to the extent that they are not able to organize themselves. And if you look at initiatives like the African um, continental uh, free trade area, you mm -hmm. know, that, that could counterbalance that, but if that's not going on, then we'll, we'll see, we'll see the, you know, the, this convergence process stopped. And it actually, there's already science for that, uh, because uh, trade growth is not, uh, is, has become very weak. Uh, we, are, we are not getting the stimulus that from trade to those economies as we used to. Mm -hmm. Carl? Yeah, I wanted to point out that the uh, value chains are, of course, disturbed by tariffs, but they are also very strongly disturbed by rules of origin. Um, the um, new agreement, um, the USMCA, is one of the examples where yeah. you have rules of origin that I would call uh, perverted, um, and they have a real effect on also what can be sourced. Um, I had a meeting with Bosch, and Bosch has set up a, a huge um, data center in Vietnam where they want to optimize um, the components that they deliver to uh, um, other um, producers in order to make sure that the rules of origin are met. This is highly complex and is getting more complex. Mm. Yes. Marcus, so I one of the characteristics, so Trump is a protectionist, so one of the characteristics of the renegotiation or the negotiations of these trade deals is they move them away from free trade. So in the case of the United States-Korea deal, we moved it away from free trade by extending the periods of uh, uh, liberalization. Uh, in the case of the agreement that we have with Canada and Mexico, uh, we did it through rules of origin and other measures, such that we call it NAFTA 0 0.8, because it's actually pulling you away from free trade. Um, and you see the same sorts of things uh, going on now uh, with respect to uh, some of these other deals as well. I was wondering, yeah, uh, well, just I'm going to ask my question, you can answer it right away. Actually, oh, I want to add uh, Carl's point uh, more specifically. USMCA has a, has a you know, clause saying that uh, if you want to use USMCA, in other words, you have to export uh, automobile uh, by paying no, no tariff, you must produce your output with uh, 35 to 40 percent of the local con uh, content should be produced by the laborers whose hourly income is above $16. Very, very specific. That right. means Mexican, Mexican hourly wage is very low, mm -hmm. so you must import uh, from the United States, for example, those parts and components mm -hmm. to produce something and export back to, to yeah. the United States. So which is yeah. Yeah, a little stupid, because mm -hmm. the idea was to raise yeah, salaries. Let me add a little anecdote from research. I mean, mm -hmm. I've, uh, I've done some work on rules of origin, and uh, what we can find there is that 
but almost always rules of origin have no real economic justification. I mean, they are usually meant to be there uh, to avoid in, pre in bilateral preferential trade agreements that third countries don't benefit from the trade preferences. Mm -hmm. but, but we know uh, there well, is some... Well, it's a defense but mechanism, isn't yes, it? Yes, but it's, it's most, in most cases, really most cases, there is no danger of the so-called trade deflection anyway, because it's costly to transport goods, and because the tariff structure is not such that it makes this deflection very profitable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have outrageous cases of rules of origin, like in the US MCA, that are clearly protectionist, but I would say that almost all rules of origin, these are hundreds of pages, also in EU trade agreements, you know, it's a lot of stuff, and most of it has no uh, rationale, well, the French care a lot about it. Wouldn't, you know, wouldn't happen. Yes, I know. Yeah. But it's cheese, protectionist. Our wine, you know, we like to. Yes. Protect well, I mean, it. there's other. There's the the GIs uh, mm -hmm. that, that protect uh, these 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 uh, food items, but the, but the point is that the, the, you know there is a legitimate case for rules of origin mm -hmm. to avoid trade deflection, but there is no economic basis for that. Or very rarely. So what what then remains is really just the protectionist the protectionist mm. uh, element. Uh, and that has been the case for the, for the last 30 years. Now the Trump administration is playing it very hard on that, mm. but it's not, a new, it's not a new feature. The EU knows that quite as well. And if you look at those rules of origin, how detailed they are, you know, this, sometimes it's really ridiculous. And that's true also, for example, in the EU-Korea EU trade mm. agreement. No? It's not something that, that we can blame the current US administration alone. But I'm curious, how, how do you view the revision of those trade deals? Is this the fool's game? Is it a way to put better, more protectionism? Because you say it's taking away free trade. I mean, all those negotiations, Japan, Korea, uh, Alina, I mean, uh, Mexico, Canada, uh, how do you view them? Totally inefficient? They're supposed to bring norms, you know, at a certain level. I mean, they're supposed to bring some good at some, some areas, or you, you, you don't find them useful at all. So the case of uh, Korea-US FTA revision, Marcus already told uh, nothing much, but uh, one thing we could have gained a lot uh -huh. from that uh, chorus FTA, because uh, original you know, agreement says uh, within, I mean, from 2021, 25% tariff on pickup truck will be gone. Mm -hmm. But through this uh, renegotiations, this 2021 is extended to 2041. So, uh, you know, yeah. we don't produce and export anything, any pickup truck yet to, to U.S., but we lost a lot of potential sure, because uh, of that. benefits uh, yeah. out of this kind of re renegotiation. So, so we are moving away from more from free trade. Yeah. Marcus and then Carl. So the NAFTA agreement was 25 years old, mm -hmm. and there was all kinds of things like digital commerce that really didn't even exist when it was negotiated. So you could make the argument that it was sort of like an old house that needed some refurbishing. And if you had had um, the kind of government that had existed in the United States for the previous three generations, what would have come out of that process would have been far from perfect, but it would have been a kind of rational attempt to bring the rules more into alignment with the actual way commerce was operating. Um, and you could, and, uh, but what happened was that effort, a lot of it was focused on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Mm -hmm because it was simply a bigger deal. Canada and Mexico were already members, so when we got TPP, we would basically be sort of cleaning the, now I'm really mixing metaphors, mm -hmm. but we would sort of be cleaning the whole house. When Trump pulled us out of TPP, that caused the trade diversion problems I alluded to earlier with respect to, say, pork in the Japanese market, but it also meant that we had to now do those things within the context of NAFTA. and. Um, a government that wanted to fix up those things probably could have done a better job, but this government is fundamentally protectionist. Mm -hmm. So it used that opportunity to do things like alter rules of origin mm -hmm. that had the effect of making that agreement, pulling the agreement away from free trade rather than moving it ever closer. Carl? No, I only wanted to add that I think that the EU in its efforts to um, conclude bilateral trade agreements generally wants to open markets. I think so, and there are new um, issues uh, beyond tariffs. I mean, all the what is happening in the trades in the services sector. This is all liberalizing. But you know that uh, there's a lot of opposition to trade deals in Europe today, and in mm -hmm. France especially. I mean, population doesn't understand them, and it's it's a hard thing to to explain nowadays why 
it would be good eventually, uh, level playing field. Uh, uh, it's just, uh, it's not working. People are not buying it anymore. I think in Europe it has a different issue than in other places. In Europe it's about um, the fear to lose influence on standards and the fear that uh, there is no uh, democratic legitimacy mm -hmm. in, in the changes. And, and of course distributional and the secrecy concerns. of it too, yeah. yeah. And of course distributional concerns. Yeah. I, th I think uh, what, uh, uh, what we have seen over, over the last um, 30 years or so, dur certainly during the period of, of, of hyper-globalization, is an increase in inequality. Um, sometimes very clearly measured in the United States, sometimes not that obvious, like in, the United, uh, like in Germany, there were since 2005, numbers are not actually moving anymore, but perceived inequality has mm -hmm. gone up quite a lot. And the, if you look at the, re the research that exists on populism, you know, there seems to be a link. And uh, many believe that uh, you know, trade openness exacerbates, uh, opening up trade exacerbates that mm -hmm. problem. It creates, it creates losers. And um, uh, you know, there's a, a, a very strong opposition uh, politically to, to allow these, 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 uh, these losses to occur uh, in periods of uh, political fragility. Uh, and I think that is m maybe in Europe the most important argument right now. That mm. the, every, many would, would believe that the, for example, Mercosur agreement is actually a good thing. It would actually help us rein in Bolsonaro in his, uh, in, you know, uh, make him uh, ab abide by the Paris agreement, for example. But uh, the you know, fragility, the political fragility within Europe makes it difficult to create losers that would uh, then you know, support populist parties and, and, mm. and, and wreck, wreck havoc uh, in, in, in ways that we don't want. Just add one more thing. Sure. I mean, your argument, like a free trade is not welcome by you know, France or EU. I think uh, this is a traditional uh, issue. Uh, I taught the international trade for many, many years. Yes. But uh, when I come to the part of political economy trade policy, you know, gains from trade is spread all over the people, whole population, mm -hmm. whole industry. Mm -hmm. But uh, loss of the you know, difficulty out of the market opening is concentrating on certain sectors. Uh, they can unite themselves and make a demonstration. They can do lots of other things. So politicians looking at these two sides, who, you know, politicians will take which part? protectionist you know, uh, policy stance is much better for their election. Mm. So now you mention about losers, you know, I think you know, politicians comes in, then populist yeah. uh, win, the, win the election. We, we were just before going back to you, Marcus, I'd like to welcome you, Mr. Watanabe. Thank well, you thank for you being here. And we were talking about free trade agreements, and I know you have a great experience on the Japanese-US uh, trade agreement, and it would be nice for you to share with us sure. what you think. We were talking about convergence of economies. It's not exactly your point of view, I think. If you might tell us uh, how, what you felt about the renegotiation between US and Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, may I yes, uh, yes, make please. intervention now? Well, uh, sorry to be late. Uh, <laughs> I thought that uh, this session will start at 4 p.m. Oh, that's, so, that was uh, wrong, that was yeah, wrong. Yeah, from 4 to 5.30, so I and <laughs> By the way, it's not a whole presentation because we're just going back and forth, you know, just, just sure. answer through this question and you'll and no be able to answer to others afterwards. No problem. Okay, uh, there's a positive side and negative side of this uh, most recent Japan-US uh, trade agreement. Uh, first of all, uh, from Japanese perspective, uh, it was quite uh, a good agreement uh, because uh, we could uh, avoid the uh, imposition of 25% uh, uh, you know, duties on Japanese cars to be imported uh, to United States from Japan. So that's one thing. And the negative side is that uh, uh, this will reduce the chances, opportunities for United States to come back to the TPP. So uh, that's and the that's uh, kind of thing? negative side. Do you think it's a good thing? Oh, a bad thing. You a mean all together, yeah. that's, that's fine. But mm. uh, kind of a negative side is that uh, uh, since uh, you know, the United States uh, has been looking for Japanese agriculture market, now uh, United States got some uh, access, that's, you know, improved yeah. access of mm -hmm. uh, US agriculture products to the Japanese market. Right. So that will reduce uh, opportunities uh, for United States to come back to TPP, uh, original TPP, that is TPP 12. So Marcus Nolan, who's sitting next to you, was disagreeing on the tariffs. Maybe he can explain why. Yeah, um, so I do not believe that this agreement spares Japan from the uh, Section 232 case on automobiles and the potential tariff. 
I mean, Prime Minister Abe wanted that commitment, but he hasn't gotten it. Um, th what the two sides have said is that there is a phase one of the negotiation, which has, uh, been, uh, which has been announced, which is a limited number of tariff cuts, or tariff cuts on a limited number of sectors, um, but, the, but the key point is it actually doesn't do that. It doesn't spare the Japanese automobile industry. Now, there's going to be a phase two of the negotiation, and perhaps at that point, Japan can extract that commitment, but uh, it hasn't thus far. Um, and the other thing, I would just make a, a minor point. You know, in the previous discussion, we were, we were discussing the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement as though it existed. It's been negotiated, it but the legislation hasn't been passed in the United States. That's true. And the issue we face now is that the House of Representatives is controlled by the Democratic Party, the Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Um, if you just went and polled the congressman, uh, you smacka or whatever you want to call it could probably pass the House of Representatives. But Pelosi wants to keep in kind of in step with whoever the eventual Democratic presidential nominee is going to be. If it looks like that's going to be Joe Biden or somebody like Beto O'Rourke, who have pretty moderate views on trade, the legislation can move forward. But if it looks like it's going to be Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, she's going to hold back on that legislation. So even in the case of, of this agreement, um, uh, we've negotiated the agreement, but the United States hasn't actually uh, passed the implementing legislation. Mm. Gabriel, and then there is an some? additional uh, collateral damage that might come from the EU-US agreement, and that is the WTO, once again, because of uh, its Article 24 that actually says that uh, free trade agreements should cover substantially all trade. So if you just pick uh, what is easy for you and leave the rest, then uh, uh, that uh, might be violating uh, Article 24. And no, who cares? The US administration certainly not, but we thought the Japanese would actually care. And, uh, and in that sense, um, you know, that's, that's a negative uh, on that agreement, at least in my, in my view. It doesn't cover substantially all trade, and it doesn't take the tariffs to zero, either one. <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, uh, you know, uh, I worked as an uh, economic affairs officer at the WTO Secretariat some time ago, dealing with Article 24. And actually, you know, after the Uruguay round negotiations, uh, you have a more precise term in, you know, in terms of, say, for instance, those FTA or customs union agreements should be concluded within a reasonable period of time. And that has been defined as uh, 10 years. So you see, uh, maybe this agreement will come into force, but in 10 years' time, that's considered to be reasonable length of time. So if uh, both Japan and the United States can agree uh, to uh, reach a higher level of coverage of this agreement, that would be fine with WTO. That's interesting. Uh, at least, I mean, it's, I think it should be very comforting for you because you see how the rules of WTO matter. Uh, at the same time, we know there is a problem with governance and a lot of ills. Can we talk a little bit about it? Because I mean, we see a lot of disruption on, on worldwide stage on trade, and WTO is not efficient in, in regulating it. So let's talk about the governance, the ills of this institution, and also we'll try to talk about its remedies. But who wants to first shot on the WTO? Carl, he's yeah. the um, I, I pick <laughs> up the brave where, one. I pick up where we were. Um, the basic rule of the WTO is the most favored nation principle. So you have to afford the same good treatment that you offer to one of the 164 members to all the other members. And the free trade agreements are actually an exemption from it. Mm -hmm. They are an exemption in that you can offer your partner more favorable uh, treaty treatment than you offer the rest. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, justification for allowing this exemption is that you have to cover essentially all trade. And we have a committee that um, deliberates uh, on the notified uh, free trade agreements, and it never produces a result um, that has a critical outcome for the parties because um, there is not the, the courage for it. Um, so it's lack of political lacks, courage of the institution? Teeth. Yeah, it lacks teeth. Mm. They um, speak about the agreement. Um, the uh, secretariat writes a factual report. The factual report uh, could actually make it very visible that uh, it does not cover essentially all trade. And then the parties, uh, not the parties, the members uh, uh, discuss, but there is no consequence. Uh, before we move to uh, the multilateral trading system, 
I want to go back to the section 232 on autos. I think uh, USTR gave uh, uh, options to uh, President Trump uh, in May. He extend his decision for, for six months. So these six months will come sometime in November. So given the fact that uh, we, we, we see uh, President Trump is very unpredictable, so by that time, whether he can extend uh, some, some more months or he can, he can declare something. So we Koreans are also concerned about the uh, uh, final decision to be made by uh, President Trump on Section 232 on autos. But the, the advantage of the free trade agreement between the US and Japan was just now described as avoiding a negative. Mm -hmm. It should actually create a positive, positive. but mm -hmm. it's only avoiding a negative. This is not what it's all about. And that too goes at least uh, against the spirit of Article 24, which says that uh, parties engaging in uh, preferential trade agreement should actually lower their, their tariffs. Uh, and if that's not happening, de facto the opposite is mm -hmm. happening. Maybe if you, if you throw in a rules of origin, uh, that is certainly not in the, in the spirit of the, of the article. But if you're talking about the WTO, I think um, it's very easy to blame the WTO, but who is the WTO? No? It, it's, it's, it's a member-driven member, member -driven organization, and mm -hmm. we, you know, when we comment about it, we often forget that. No? We blame mm -hmm. the WTO, the WTO is inefficient, it doesn't enforce its rules, et cetera, et cetera. But then it's just the sum of its 164 members. And uh, so and then you know, everyone, including the, even the Europeans, that are very, at least, pay lip service. Vocal, yeah, yes, yeah, uh, about they, it. they have uh, a lot Mr. to Mr. Watanabe and then Marcus Nolan. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, one additional comment on this Japan-US uh, recent agreement on Japan-US uh, uh, trade deal. Uh, one of the uh, major sort of misgivings of uh, this agreement is, uh, is the fact that the uh, uh, United States could not offer the uh, uh, zero duty treatment on the parts of the uh, parts and components for car industries that uh, United States offered uh, in TPP-12 negotiation that was concluded in mm -hmm. October 2015. So uh, you see the entire, uh, you know, the passenger car uh, duty uh, is 2.5%. Mm -hmm. uh, even in a TPP-12 agreement, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, there was um, uh, the uh, phasing out of 2.5% uh, duties over 25 years, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but instead, for the car parts and components, uh, Japan got uh, more than 87% of the tariff lines uh, dealing with uh, the car parts have been subject to uh, zero duty. Uh, mm -hmm. It's uh, immediate uh, duty elimination. Uh, that was the agreement in October 2015. Mm -hmm. So that is the thing that we couldn't get. And mm -hmm. that is the major sort of misgivings, I would thought. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Marcus, you wanted to add something? Yeah, so the WTO has all sorts of problems. But the WTO is only as good as its membership. And I want to reemphasize a point I made at the outset, which is that for 80 years, the United States government tried to promote a open, liberal, rules-based trade system. Wasn't always effective, didn't always, you know, always adhere to its own uh, norms, but it was basically supportive of that kind of system. That changed in 2016. Uh, we now have a government that would be perfectly happy to watch the WTO strangle by simply not appointing appellate judges. Um, yeah, we're going to come to that. And, and, and so the question is why? Mm. What changed in the United States? And is it aberrant? And can we expect a reversion to the norm? Or is this the future? Because if this is the future, then it really poses a different set of questions for the system. Mm. There is a, a growing body of scholarly analysis in the United States that tries to explain this shift. I've done some of it. Jeff Frieden, who's sitting out in the audience, has done yeah. some of it. Some of it is based on looking at individual voter preference. Some of it is done using analyzing county level uh, voting patterns. Some of it is experimental. And the lessons that seem to be emerging from that, um, that uh, work are actually quite disturbing. The turn towards protectionism in the United States seems to be based on a pernicious sense of victimhood, and a victimhood in two different channels. 
One is, is usual that would be familiar to everybody in this room. Import competing sectors, especially declining industries, are getting hurt by imports. They want protection. And if you look at the Trump administration, a lot of the people in it or his advisors are uh, people who were uh, owners or managers in declining uh, uh, industrial sectors of the US economy. But the other one is at the individual level. And what it seems, the evidence seems to suggest is that this turn towards protection is very much um, driven by or associated with uh, white identity politics or racism. And really? it's the notion that uh, uh, a growing anxiety among part of the white population in the United States about loss of group status, loss of their ability to control the system uh, for their own benefits at the individual level. And then that is reinforced by a sense among the elites who have these ideas of declining US uh, status at the international level. And the fact that China p is both regarded as an economic and geopolitical rival mm -hmm. means that that is where you, where you get the focus on China. So looking for, to towards the future, obviously a, an electoral strategy that, that emphasizes anger in the white population is demographically a losing hand in the long run, mm. uh, whether it can work in 2020 or not. Um, if, if, if Trump is able to avoid impeachment and does get reelected, then I think the second term it will be Katie bar to the door on the kind of issues that we're discussing. Can you tell us what that means exactly? It means, <laughs> it, means, it, means it means closed <laughs> down because catastrophe is happening. Okay. Um, if the Democrats win, that's, that's no nirvana because uh, while the Democrats, uh, uh, and, there's a, and these are not just my opinion, there's a lot of data to support this, are much more positively inclined towards international cooperation, um, their views on trade are not necessarily liberal. And if you've got certain candidates and certain people, you could get a pretty reasonable trade policy. But if you get some of the others, uh, it could be quite challenging as well. So the, the, fut the political economy in the United States, future outcomes range from kind of OK to disaster. disaster. Well, that, that's very comforting. Yeah, Gabriel, you wanted to add something, and then Mr. Tart? Yeah, I just wanted Mark, to say that, that there, is only, there is certainly this, this um, uh, international US-centered uh, uh, discussion yes. about the white, uh, uh, grumpy man. Uh, but, but there's also, and I think here's where the Republicans and the Democrats uh, converge, there's also this uh, geostrategic issue with China. No? So when, the, the, when China entered into the WTO in 2001, uh, no one really envisaged that uh, in a period of 15 years or so, they would be able to challenge uh, the United States by having an, an economy that uh, uh, is almost as big and growing twice as, as fast. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is, uh, there is, there is uh, and this geostrategic uh, discussion will not stop. Uh, mm -hmm. And it will not stop uh, uh, when there is a different uh, person in the White House. Mm -hmm. And it also has implications for Europe, of course, because uh, uh, we too must uh, ask ourselves, and we have seen the session here today uh, about, you know, the. Uh, the values and democracy you know, that, that uh, I think these are these are important uh, important components uh, mm -hmm. too in this in this discussion and that uh, don't uh, uh, lend to very much optimism neither because that geostrategic strategic struggle which is not just a power military economic power is also about values that that won't go away. Mm. Okay, uh, I want to remind you that uh, we are very sorry to talk about WTO in Marrakesh. Because uh, you know, 1994, Marrakesh had a meeting to produce WTO. You know, now we talk about the you know, gloomy aspect of WTO. <laughs> In fact, uh, seven years ago, I visited Rabat uh, mm -hmm. to have a bilateral uh, ministers meeting. And then they asked me, where do you want to go uh, after uh, Rabat? So I want to see Marrakesh, because uh, Marrakesh is the place uh, who produced uh, the, the WTO. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We came here and tried to find which hotel hosted this <laughs> ministerial <laughs> conference. I, I forgot the name, but huge uh, hotel. That's a pity, yeah. Huge hotel. <laughs> and some hotel manager come down and explain about the hotel. Yeah. So I said, do you know this place? Uh, you know, we have mm -hmm. a meeting for WTO. He asked me, what is WTO? 
Oh, no. So no. there's no, no <laughs> plot, no any, anything. Uh, no so plague, it's a pity, yeah. you know. So in any case. Uh, well, it's a good time you're here to, you know, give it uh, the right. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'm also very, you know, pessimistic uh, about uh, for, 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 for future. I'm sorry, to, uh, you know, no, Mr. Carl Brown is gonna, here. I see we have 15 minutes left, so Carl is going to speak, and we're going to talk a little bit about the settlement problem with the WTO, and then we'll open up for questions. Okay. I, I want to say that the U.S. has been the positive leader for more than 70 years in trade policy, starting before the gut, and uh, they have used trade policy as an element of their foreign policy, as an instrument of peace policy, and um, if the U.S takes this role that you have described just now, um, this does not solve the real issue because it only deals with the external elements that are um, um, the challenges for the US. The real challenges are inside the US. You, the, the problem is America is not great anymore. When America was great, they could behave in the way they behaved as positive leaders. And to make America great again is not happening via external conflicts. Mm. And it's well, it comes back to the disgruntled, you know, white people you were talking about who elected Trump and and expressed that. Um, but uh, somewhere uh, America has been expected is on this uh, appointing judges for the WTO because it's the only way for countries to to settle their differences. And we know that this uh, this part of your organization is really at a standstill, and in December, if no judge is appointed, uh, it's gone, it's dead. So uh, what can we do about this? <laughs> Long I silence. Mean, um, th this problem has started in 2017, um, and um, I think the uh, efforts to resolve the issue have started pretty late. Right now, we are having a group of uh, countries that are under the leadership of the New Zealand ambassador trying to um, tackle issues on a technical level. And here I would come to the, um, one of the elements of uh, the title of our meeting this afternoon, Trust. Mm -hmm. um, one could uh, try to rebuild trust by solving a few of the technical issues. Um, and one has to get the Europeans and the, the um, Americans uh, talking to one another because I think the Europeans have uh, made some uh, very good proposals picking up all the grievances of the Americans one by one without saying that they share the concern but they offer um, some approach to it. Um, but the Americans are not yet engaging and I must say my uh, suspicion is they have other issues. They are dealing with China, they are dealing with uh, USMCA, and the WTO is a third priority mm -hmm. for them at this point in time. Okay, well, that's not very complicated. So we have some questions here. Uh, we're gonna ask for the mics, and uh, of course, uh, so there's one here, one here, and some two over there. So if you can bring the, the mics, please. Here, Mr. Gruffa, and then there are two more over there. Thank you. I'm asking all the panel, what do you think will be the influence or the fact that today on, on globalization, on the fact that today, a matter of fact, anybody can buy anything through the web and pay with uh, uh, Bitcoin or with all the other Bitcoin, yeah. Bitcoins, all the other uh, coins to which are exist, which means the meaning of today of globalization is much less because everybody can buy anything from whatever he wants. What do you think it will be? The world is changing. And I don't know if the governments are taking into consideration the fact that, as a matter of fact, now, even we're speaking about banks, so Facebook mm -hmm. making his own bank, Apple opening his own car, currency, his own bank. Yes. On currency, you can pay, mm -hmm. you circumvent all, all the systems. What will be the influence on, glo on the in, ge uh, in general globalization? Do you think that governments should, uh, if they would, if they would, they should discuss any changing, any changes 
and globalization because of the fact they have no control anymore of anything that's going between countries. Shadow trade, Gabriel. Yeah, so, so there's, there's been a long history now of uh, thinking in the WTO or in, the, in Brussels or in Washington to rewrite trade law, no? that to take into account those new channels of distribution, for example, e-commerce uh, or, uh, or, or these, these, these um, uh, emerging uh, technologies. Uh, but we have not made any progress there. Uh, and there's, there's something that I think is very important in this entire conversation discussion to remember that uh, uh, policies matter, tariffs matter, but over history, what has driven globalization much more than tariffs has been technology, has been the invention of the steamship, has uh, been the containerization of international transportation, has been the automation and digitalization of logistics. So this is more important uh, than tariffs. And uh, so if you talk about the future of globalization, uh, this will be probably made as much by technology uh, as, by, as by politicians. Mm. Mr. Barr? I want to add one thing. Uh, you, you mentioned about new, new uh, phenomena, but the WTO, uh, they started so-called Doha round from 2001. Until now, we didn't do anything. Uh, we couldn't do anything. Not we didn't do, we tried, but we didn't do anything. But uh, because of that, uh, we cannot accommodate to the, you know, the new, new development in the world, world economy. But the thing is, WTO's decision-making mechanism among 164 countries, they only decide based on consensus. As long as you know, one country is objecting to some idea, we don't do anything. So WTO has been extremely outdated. I agree with you, but in the future, without changing this you know, decision-making mechanism, we cannot do anything. Yeah. So no, that's very clear. So, yeah, a question here. Oh, alors, Carl, and then the question. Alizy, go ahead. Uh, sorry. It's not outed, okay. Uh, no, and one should not fool oneself. Uh, having a few reforms uh, wouldn't help at all when you don't have the willingness to cooperate. You, you can design new rules, but if you have no willingness to cooperate, it doesn't work. What uh, Mr. Bach says is completely correct, but uh, in addition to what he observes, we now have a number of uh, working groups on issues like uh, e-commerce, investment facilitation, on small and medium-sized enterprises, on domestic regulation for services, which are no longer aiming for consensus, but which are run by a limited group of countries between 56 and 85, uh, who are aiming at designing rules and do it in such a way that latecomers could join, but they do not want to be stopped by those who have no positive agenda. So things are happening. It is not all gloomy. Okay, so next question. Well, uh, thanks to the panels. Thanks to you, Virginie. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, there's more bad news. I'm the one who believes that things are not going to get better, regardless of what might be the outcome of the election, for one of two reasons. First of all, I, I agree that it's probably very difficult to get some sort of agreement between China and the U.S. before the U.S. election. The Chinese may be also hoping that things would be better with the next administration, so they are not necessarily in a rush to sign something. But I would like to take one or two very short examples. I was in Canada early October last year when the USMCA was approved by Canada. And one of the things that was, and that was on the uh, Canadian media, not the fake news from the US, the <laughs> Canadian media. And they were saying that one of the reasons why Trump was happy with this agreement was that for Wisconsin, which is, as you know, a dairy state, there was an increase of 5% and the milk product that could be exported to Canada. So it was marginal, that was something that could be used during the campaign to say, I've done something for, the, for these people that you were talking about mm -hmm. who are feeling that free trade and globalization is not working to their best interest. The second remark that I wanted to make is it's not just trade, it's also market access. And I agree with you again, Marcus, when you say that the important stuff is transfer, forced transfer of technology or intellectual property. We talked about that, but nothing has really happened. At the same time, there's been significant steps taken in the US in the Cyprus Council for Foreign Investment in the United States, taken by limiting access of Chinese and other foreign interests in so-called security sensitive area, and we've seen some of this. 
And that's, you know, if you can't export, you can always say, I can make an acquisition or I can set up a mm -hmm. business abroad, which gives you the same market access. But if you, at the same time you impose higher tariff and also restrict access to certain sectors of the economy, things are getting much worse. Yeah. And the last thing, I a slight disagreement with you again, I'm not picking on you. <laughs> when you say, when Trump pulled us off the TPP, the TPP was never passed. He pulled us from the Paris Accord, from the nuclear deal, but the TPP was not passed. And in spite of Obama at the TPA, he didn't use it because at that time, as you well know, Bernie Sanders was against it, Elizabeth, um, Hillary Clinton was against it, and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Yes. And I agree with you. I mean, when I look at the Democratic side, Warren and Sanders are going to be worse than Trump on that score. <laughs> okay. So uh, just uh, two quick questions, one here, one here, and then one here. We don't have much time, so um, if you don't mind going fast. The, the question is uh, precisely on uh, this key factor, which is the evolution of the U.S. in the coming uh, months, you know, and, and two years, you know. And first, uh, so it is a question mainly uh, uh, targeted towards uh, Marcus. You know. <laughs> uh, and the qu first question is, do you consider realistic that we have a scenario in which in case of uh, difficulties, uh, which uh, during the campaign, or of beginning of a recession, or a, a stock market decline, uh, Trump will do everything possible to have a final agreement with the Chinese, not a temporary one, and he, he could be ready to sacrifice what I would call the structural part of uh, the U.S. demands, I mean uh, technology extortion uh, uh, and, for example, uh, IPR, etc., uh, in order just to increase uh, uh, Chinese imp uh, U.S. exports to China. And uh, so, do you think it's a scenario? Because I know that uh, I heard that, like Tizer, is was is fearing that and is ready to resign on that, which will be not the first, not the last mm -hmm. to resign from this administration. <laughs> the second question is after the election, in terms of scenarios, for Trump, we see very clearly the only thing one can say that he would be even more unleashed than he is now, especially with trade. Everybody agrees on that. Uh, what could you say what about the President Warren? You know, because we cannot rule out Elizabeth Warren. She's really uh, the leading candidate. You know. So, okay, so two questions. Uh, is he going to have a deal at all cost? And what would Elizabeth Warren do? Okay, so uh, the issue with Trump is could Trump, uh, in the interest of getting elected, uh, sort of sacrifice a really comprehensive structural agreement with China just to take some kind of market access deal and, and declare victory? Of course. And in fact, I would say he's likely to do that. Uh, that's, his, that's been his pattern for three years. He makes, he makes grandiose statements and claims, and then he settles for small deals and then tells the, the American public that he's, you know, he's done a great job. I mean, he did this, I mean, the first deal with China was a deal that Obama negotiated and then Trump took credit for it. So yes, of course that's what he'll do. The, the question is then what does he do next because the problems don't go away. With respect to Elizabeth Warren, she has um, uh, released a very detailed proposal on trade policy. It's on her website and I would just recommend you take a look at it. Um, the thing about um, Warren, you, you know, the way I would describe it is with the Republicans you get protectionism. With the Democrats you get trade with social work. So yes, we will have trade with you, but we want to fix your human rights, we want to mm -hmm. fix your environment, we want to fix your labor Wages. laws. We co it comes with a lot of baggage. And if you read Elizabeth Warren's policy proposals, uh, I personally find them disturbing because they assume a lot of capacity in developing countries that I simply don't believe is there. And while she may be genuine and sincere in wanting to eliminate child labor and improve labor conditions and human rights and the environment and everything else in these countries, uh, the U.S. Uh, trade system is a complainant-driven system. And once you put in a law that says, you know, if, if Ghana violates some kind of labor standard, then it can't get access to the United States market, 
Whatever the motivation of Elizabeth Warren and her team was when they put it in, I can guarantee you that American textile producers and the textile workers unions will be hiring investigators and lawyers to go <laughs> scour Ghana and find some violation of this law, which then can be used to block access. Mm. So, you know, one last plug, since I plugged Elizabeth Warren, this is much more important. I do this stuff professionally, and I can't follow it. The ins and outs, and what has been delayed, and what has been raised, and what has been lowered, and what has been postponed, and what has been brought forward. My colleague, Chad Bown, has a completely reliable timeline that he maintains on the Peterson Institute website. So if you want to know what's going on with US trade policy, where the current state of play is, and how we got there, go to, to PIIE.com and look for Chad Bown's uh, <laughs> trade timeline. It is, it, is, it is absolutely indispensable mm -hmm. for this set of issues. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Okay, we have one minute left, so I'm going to choose someone, and it will be the last person is going to be you in the front because you haven't talked at all since uh, this. No, no, this man in front because we've heard you before. If it's okay, and this is the last one. Uh, Professor Machro, uh, senior fellow at Policy Center for the New South. Je vais parler en français. J'adresse ma question à Monsieur Karl Brunet, et je sais qu'il comprend le français, qu'il parle très bien en français. Alors, la perspective d'un blocage de l'organe d'appel par les Américains paraît presque inévitable et lourde de conséquences. Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas dans l'enceinte de l'OMC une réflexion à revenir à la pratique du GATT avec des working groups comme étant une alternative, euh, même si cela comporte l'inconvénient de revenir à cette notion de euh, diplomacy oriented system than rules oriented system et Merci. The answer is uh, no. Because what was uh, happening in the olden days, you were making deals irrespective of what the legal situation was. Now, um, the rule of law prevails. What are the thoughts on what is happening when the appellate, uh, when the appeal function goes away is threefold. One could make a public statement um, as a party and invite others to join that one will not appeal. Whatever case will happen for a transition period, one will not appeal. Um, the European Union and Canada have uh, set up uh, something that is um, an arbitration built on Article 25 of the uh, WTO uh, rules on dispute settlement, and that resembles in the fashion that the Europeans have chosen very closely the appeal procedures in the appellate body. And the third is, of course, that uh, people appeal to the Nirvana, and then um, the um, first instance uh, decisions cannot uh, enter into force, and people do what they want. And for me, this is a regression of civilization. <laughs> uh, and that's going to be our last word. So it's a little sad, but uh, thank you very much uh, for all our panelists and, uh, and talk about trade and WTO.